to another episode of Dialogues with me, Richard Reeves. I'm talking today to John Gray, who is one of the most provocative and influential philosophers of his generation. He and I have been arguing about liberalism and post-liberalism for a long time now, so it's a real treat for me to, to get him onto the podcast. We talk about the state of liberal societies today and why, in his view, liberalism as a political philosophy contained the seeds of its own destruction from the beginning. So rather than liberal societies having gone astray, if you like, he, he argues that they were doomed from the beginning because they have a view of the good life, the autonomous, self-creating life and so on. And, and he thinks that our goal in life should not be to create ourselves through our projects and commitments, which is the typically liberal view, but instead to realize our own nature and live by it. He believes that our fear of death and self-consciousness leads us to philosophy and religion and so on. But he actually is very critical of philosophy. He says that posing as a cure, it is actually a symptom of the disorder that it pretends to remedy. So we talk about this, the rise of hyper-liberalism, particularly in the US, and how a one view of the good life is now, is now being used in some ways uh, to uh, be disrespectful of other forms of life. We talk about his new book, Feline philosophy and how cats actually are better than us at realizing their own nature. The central argument he makes is that rather than seeking to make ourselves something different, we should be content with who we are. Doesn't think we can become cat-like in that sense. And so we talk about what the, the alternatives are. He also provocatively claims that the US can no longer claim to be a liberal political culture, in part because of the way that the culture wars in the US have politicized everything. And he believes that a recognizably liberal political culture has to have large parts of it that are actually not political. So we talk about all of that. He mentions the, the influence of his own cat, Julian. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. John Gray, welcome to Dialogues. Uh, very good to be talking with you again, Richard. Yes, after many years and across across the pond, John, it's a real a real pleasure, a delight. The, the difficulty is going to be to contain contain this conversation because I have decades of questions that we've been <laughs> same here, same here. <laughs> engaging on these for a long time. But uh, and we're going to talk about your your book uh, for sure. But we're going to go back before we go forwards. And unusually in the book, you you offer acknowledgments not only to professional colleagues and to loved ones, but also to your cats. And so many readers will be left wondering about Julian, who was twenty three years old. Your cat Julian when you wrote the book when he um, was in his 20, I, i'll in tell his you 20. he was in his 23rd year he passed away before he reached 23 um uh but he had a very happy life and i think and a very long life for a cat of course uh, of the four cats we had over 30 years who lived together as four for part of that time he was the most um he was the last of them and he was the most maybe tranquil and laid back and peaceful and led me to some of my reflections as to why it is that the default condition for cats is contentment and the default condition of humans seems to be restlessness mm. or even anxiety uh, at their place in the world. Why is it that cats, when they're not hunting or mating or playing, are either uh, sleeping or simply lying in some pose of uh, great uh, relaxation? Whereas humans, if you put them in a situation where they can't distract themselves, seem to become more and more anxious. And so they seek philosophies and religions to um, deal with their anxiety. So that, in a sense, living with Julian and with the other cats who were similar for uh, nearly 30 years was uh, one of the reasons I wrote that book. Yes, I think you quote Pascal as saying that people seem unable to sit quietly in a room, which is, of course, yes. the thing that, that cats excel at. We have a cat ourselves who's also, I think, re reaching the end of, end of her life. So Julian, in some ways, could be seen as a, a, a not a co-author of, a, but a serious <laughs> contributor to feline, uh, feline philosophy, your book. Well, he wouldn't, he wouldn't write it because, as I say in the book, the thing about cats is they don't need philosophy. If they did engage in philosophy, if they had the intellectual equipment to engage in philosophy, I think it would be a form of play <laughs> or, or, or entertainment. They, they, they couldn't, I think, take it as seriously as humans do because um, the, the needs that drive humans uh, to philosophy and to religion, I believe, they're not as different as people think. And they're almost, uh, actually, I think the distinction is almost um, arbitrary as well as culturally highly specific. But they lack the, these needs as far as we can tell. So they would do it as a 
form of entertainment if they did it. They'd see philosophy as a kind of playground as opposed to this existential struggle over the meaning of life, which is how we tend to to, to weight it. They, yes. they, 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 yeah. they would treat philosophical concepts the same way that they treat a, a ball or something. They, they would play around play, with it. Play around well, with it. Borges, in one of his wonderful stories, uh, imagines a world in which metaphysics is, he says, a branch of fantastic art. People create world pictures the way they create paintings. And that, of course, is another way of um, looking at philosophy, although I, I think it's not the case that most philosophers who have existed have done that. I think most philosophers have imagined, at least, that they were trying to represent something true. But one could think of philosophy in that way. Some of my earliest engagement with your work was John Stuart Mill, uh, uh, Mill on Liberty, A Defense, which was published in 1983. And then the second edition, which was published in 1986, I think should 96. have probably... Uh, 1996, I'm sorry, 96. Yes, yes so 13 yes, right. years later, you published a second yes. edition. And I, and I think really it could have been fairly called you know, Mill on Liberty and Attack. You do criticize Millian liberalism, mm -hmm. I think, for its kind of Eurocentrism, its philosophy of history and so on. And, and you say the Mill's liberal project collapses and along with it, the liberal project itself, because I think you think Mill does about the best job you can do. Uh, and even he fails. And therefore, you end up in this position by 1996, which is... Uh, let's say post-liberal or anti kind of talk talk a little bit about what happened to you in those 13 years john and how important that has been because i think that for me anyway that lays the foundation for a lot of what happens to your think mm. thought thereafter well i'll begin richard by mentioning that in the 1983 edition i uh since we are in no better a position than mill was in terms of scientific knowledge to derive yeah. liberalism or ground liberalism on some empirical premises. The difference between my position then in 83 and the one I set out in the extra parts of the 1996 edition, 13 years later, is that I, I judge that the evidence points not to a not unreasonable uh, wager, but to one that's unreasonable. Now, you rightly asked, what was it that happened in between? Well. There's a few things. The most obvious one, but it's not actually, I think, the uh, the most profound, but the most obvious one was that um, in 1989, 1991, communism collapsed. And the Fukuyama thesis with which I engaged right from October 1989 and, in fact, rejected even before the wall went down in 1989, uh, uh, I wrote an, an article in an American um, conservative magazine, um, National Review, which I've reprinted in my book, Great Anatomy, whose title you suggested to me, Richard. A very good memory. Good, <laughs> good title. Uh, um, I wrote an article saying, is this the end of history or the end of liberalism? Of liberalism. And I concluded that the upshot of the collapse of communism, which was then underway, would be a move to a world in which both Marxism uh, and communism would disappear or become greatly weaker as um, large-scale political forces uh, and other types of political force, nationalism, fundamentalism, would be uh, preeminent. Now that happened, so right from that moment onwards, I thought that it would be liberalism as much as communism would suffer a kind of obsolescence or become historically rather redundant, partly for the obvious reason that it had defined itself in Cold War terms very largely and by reference to another, to, to a different ideology, but for a couple of slightly different reasons which are deeper. I never interpreted Soviet communism as, an, as a non-Occidental phenomenon. My view of what was happening then, back in 89, was in a way the opposite of what the Western view wasn't, which was that Enlightenment liberalism had triumphed in Russia. Right, right. Whereas you saw it as one kind of Enlightenment versus another kind of Enlightenment, but they were and both they, they were both children of the Enlightenment. It was a family squabble, effectively. It was a family squabble. I called it exactly that, Richard, at the time. And so when the Soviet system went down, what I expected was at best a hybrid, which I think we got for a while. Putin was pro-European and even. Before Putin, Yeltsin was 
quite pro-Western as well. And gradually, not maybe inevitably, there've been lots of contingencies and so on, but we've uh, ended up with a political regime which defines itself partly for reasons of expediency, no doubt, but defines itself by opposition to the West. So, um, I mean, th that experience fed into my um, view, which was that far from being somehow intrinsically universal, liberalism was a particular form of life or of extended family of forms of life, which had emerged in parts of the world, primarily, as I later argued, as a set of footnotes to certain types of Christianity or certain types of monotheism, and that its, its claim to universality not only replicated or reflected, mirrored that of Christianity, but that it was extremely difficult, I, I think impossible, to defend the universalistic claims of liberalism without invoking some kinds of theological or transcendental mm -hmm. arguments. Now, of course, all secular liberals either find that they're incredulous when one, even now when one argues that, or they reject it violently and categorically because they define themselves, secular liberals, uh, uh, in a binary way uh, by reference to a set of beliefs that they have rejected. And so I, if I understand correctly where you, you landed, is that uh, embedded within uh, Enlightenment liberalism is a view of the good life. It's perfectionist, you know, in its Christian origins and so on. And that in the end, the reason the project founders and that you know, Mill tries to tries to balance this act between saying, this is the best way to live, which is autonomous, self-created, chosen, etc., as opposed to given, traditional and so on. Um, but at the same time, I'd really like to be a pluralist and like everybody to do the same. And in the end, you can't you just can't you know ride both horses. And I think you give Mill credit for being more honest about that than his successors, right? At least, I mean, the 20th century liberals you know, pretend they're not being Eurocentric, that they don't have an ideal life. Um, whereas at least Mill kind of admitted that he did. So is that is that a fair summary of where you landed on, on kind of critique? Well, I found, I find and I still find in some way, I mean, certainly Mill's liberalism is one of the most plausible forms of liberalism, liberal theory, liberal, that I think there's ever been. And it's superior to the forms, many of the, most of the forms that succeeded it, because first of all, it doesn't rest on a, so to speak, apodictic or a priori theory of human rights. This again is a very important feature of Mill. I mean, the background for Mill's thinking is not a constitution which sets up fixed rights. The background is the British Parliament, which he thought should apply his maxims of, of liberty, but they would change over time because it's there about harm, not rights ultimately. And and I think that's a, an interesting and powerful form of liberalism. So I have a lot of time for Mill uh, and st still do. But I thought it broke down partly because of the experience since the collapse of communism. But I have to say more because that experience crystallized certain doubts that I had, as I said, right at the start back in 83, which is that uh, only liberal democracy or what or democratic capitalism can be legitimate, can be accepted as popularly legitimate. And it's what many liberals still think. And I think that's false because although legitimacy comes and goes, it's not in itself the creature of a theory. It's something that exists in historical practice. Uh, I think Putin had a high degree of legitimacy when um, for a while China, Chinese regime, uh, even Xi Jinping's had quite a lot of legitimacy. Does it have more or less now? It's a delicate uh, empirical matter. What I think Fukuyama definitely missed out, apart from that, which is actually potentially more important, was a mutation in Western liberalism, which I think it ha has occurred, which would eliminate or at least change in substantial ways the type of system that the whole world was supposedly converging on, at least as the most legitimate system, would itself become illegitimate in the liberal societies themselves. And that's happened to the most significant in America, where you're, where you're now sitting. And here, I mean, what I say now might be, you might think it's hyperbolic or you might not agree with it, but I don't think that America can any longer claim the United States to be a, a liberal political culture in an historically familiar sense. Certainly, it still has elections. It has democratic institutions. It has something like a rule of law. But one of the features of a, a liberal political order and of a liberal political culture is a wide range of uh, institutions that are not polarized, that are not heavily politicized, that are not the scenes of ideological battles being waged, like universities, like 
newspapers like the media, and all of these in the US now are convulsed by internal ideological conflicts. And the most powerful intellectual trend in the country is a kind of what I've called a hyperliberalism or alt liberalism, in which Uh, certain arguments about social justice, about individuality, about identity, are sort of sort of keeping radicalized, and and this leads me, of course, to the deeper argument, which is that the uh, there is a kind of self undermining dialectic within liberalism. As I've argued about Mill, the radical anti custom, anti uh, traditionalist theory of individuality, which says you've only got individuality if you, so to speak, ship your identity in the way you want. If you just accept it lazily, Mill might say, just accept that you are what the society, the conventions, the traditions, chance has made you, then you're not really a self-formed individual, which is partly comes, I think, of course, from European romanticism. This, yeah. this, John, this just brings me to where actually where I wanted to go anyway, which is so yeah. the, the self-undermining nature of liberalism is that on the one hand, it's pluralism, but it has this ideal of life, which is autonomous, self-created. And so yeah. then, and that's why you've recently written that On Liberty, so this is Mills On Liberty, presents the canonical argument mm. for freedom of expression, but it also contains the seeds of the threat to free expression at the present mm. time. And the reason for that is because from, from the perfectionist ideal life uh, liberalism of Mill, it makes sense to silence the enemies of progress. So rather than being the champion of free speech, which is how John Hyatt and I think of him, you sort of say, well, actually, if you look hard at his thinking, it contains the seeds of this cancel culture because it's like, no, no, you're on the wrong side of history. And so we we should silence. Well, look so- at the people who are, I mean, the way I put it, look at the people who are sort of left out from the Indian vision. Supposing you're someone who says, I don't want to shape myself. I'm happy to, uh, to conform, to obey the injunctions of a traditional religion. I'm not going to be autonomous and I'm not even going to seek individuality. I'm not interested in it. I don't care about it. What I care about is this, are these things. I think that's, in some countries, possibly even America, a majority. Uh, it's certainly large minor- minorities in many countries. So what happens to them? Now, what's happened in practice to them, I think, is that they're effectively you're irrational or you're, you're falling behind modernity or in some sense you're oppressive. Let me try and make, make yeah. defense and we'll move on from yeah. and back to Julian yeah. and feline philosophy. Because in some ways, well, the answer to the question, what happens to these people, right? You call them the people who, some the people, the tra- traditionalists or the people who want to muddle along. One answer to that question would be under any recogniz- recognizably million liberal society, the answer would be nothing. Uh, I want to go back to a particular case in point, which is mm-hmm. the argument about polygamy that was sparked in the US by yeah. the Mormon church. Yeah. And at the end of chapter four of On Liberty, he pointed out that this was just driving America insane. He said they don't mind it among Hindus and Chinese people and Muslim people, but but for, by people who speak English and profess to be a kind of Christian, this is driving people crazy. And so he said what's being discussed in the US is, uh, and he quotes somebody here, as not, not a crusade, but a civilized aid against this poly- uh, polygamous community to bring them back up to standards, etc. And Mill goes on to say, it appears to me that there are no community has a right to force another to be civilized. That's a good test case of Mill, right? So he, he, he hates polygamy and he does so for largely feminist reasons, but he's saying, but he says, look, the women who are doing this, this is voluntary. Leave them alone. Let them be polygamous. I think that's a kind of argument that whether or not it's consistent with everything else Mill says, it's like, look, there's a bunch of people over here who just want to accept the teachings of a particular church uh, or be Mormon. Fine. Uh, but you see, so, so if, nothing happens to these people. That's a powerful, that's, that's a cogent and powerful counter argument, and uh, both in the form that you put it and in the form that Mill puts it. But I guess a contemporary who is what I would call a hyper liberal who likes the chapter on individuality very much, the chapter in which you're only fully human almost if you've created yourself yes, like a work of art. You've carved, you're something, you're, you've carved yourself or authored your own life or whatever. Yeah. You're not just a speaking machine. I mean, he says the mechanical people who live by habit, they're not even fully human. They don't embody what he calls the permanent interests of man as a progressive being. If you're not interested in progressing even in your own life, <laughs> you're happy to stick to some religion or muddle along without any religion or philosophy, just as many, many people do and always have done and always will do, in my view, then you're not really fully human. The temptation of a hyper-liberal like that is to say, well, in that case, 
we do want to civilize these people. I agree with you about the hyperliberalism or the alt liberal and the, and the danger of the imposition of an ideal as opposed to the advocacy of an ideal. And I think the difference between you know the, the, the liberals who struggle with these inherent tensions within liberalism and the ones who imagine that they, they like don't Mill, like Mill, like like Berlin. Like Berlin, um, like yourself, and although you wouldn't be described as a liberal now, but we, I want to, I want actually want to move now. I want to go back to Julian. I want to get back to the cat. If we can be sure of one thing, it is that Julian never worried about this stuff. And it's interesting, actually, at Brookings now, we're um, we're doing this distant socialising thing where every day someone says how they're getting through lockdown and so on. And then one of the questions is, who would you like to be for a day? And I, my answer, you know, if you could be one who person, not for what? A, who not what? I think it's. It might be, but but, but it, what either how, however the question is phrased, uh, my answer, of course, my answer was Harriet Taylor Mill, so I can spend the day with John Stuart Mill, but was a weird, <laughs> a weird answer. But um, but the number of people who say I'd like to be my cat is be, yeah. I have, it's extraordinary, and there is a sort of some wisdom in that. And actually, in in your 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 new book, uh, you do actually feline I think, philosophy, feline, feline philosophy. philosophy, yeah, um, cats and the beating of life, cats exactly. What to, what you can learn from your cat, and uh, I. I understand the book is kind of arguing uh, about ethics in the proper sense. You kind of point out that it comes from the Greek word uh, ethikos, which actually is about it's about practice, it's about arising from habit and so on. And the, the whole move towards the Cartesian, I think, therefore I am rationalist turn has left us with this issue of constantly trying to solve problems. We're trying to find we're trying to find meaning beyond our lives rather than meaning within our lives. And actually, you have this lovely phrase about philosophy, um, which is that posing as a cure. Philosophy is a symptom of the disorder it pretends to remedy. Mm. Other animals do not need to divert themselves from this condition, whereas happiness in humans is an artificial state. For cats is their natural condition. Mm. So happiness is natural for them because, I think if I understand you correctly, they're aligning their lives with their nature. That's the question they're trying, trying to get you into Taoism. But for you, a good life is one led according to our nature rather than one uh, lived by some external ideal. And that's what cats have cats have kind of got that is that a fair summary yes uh, it's very fair richard i would add one thing to it linking it up with our earlier discussion of mill which is that um for cats uh and other non-human animals but maybe cats particularly because of their peculiar uh, traits as a species the meaning of life is not a project it is for mill in other words they embody their idea of the meaning of their own lives in a set of goals or uh, enterprises uh, uh, and when they break down fail or are no longer possible because there's some change in the world like lockdown mm. like a pandemic and lockdown it's easy to fall into anxiety or even despair because they can't realize the meaning of their life so i mean i think it's uh, one of the features of the million ideal of what it means to be a person. It's also in John Rawls, by the way, later, which is you have a, a plan of life, a, a set of projects, which over the course of a life, you realize the meaning of your life, if you're successful. Is that, of course, for cats, um, if they could recognize the, any idea, if they had the mental, the capacity for abstract thought that required to recognize the idea of a meaning of life, they wouldn't see as applying to their own lives is that um, the meaning of life isn't a project it's something they revert to because they're content with the sensation of of life itself without ever putting it in that way i mean julian didn't sit back and say well here i'm enjoying the sensation of life that's all i need he just enjoyed it it was it was in it was his default condition uh, uh whereas humans and if this kind of generates the obvious paradox in my position it seems to be natural for humans to rebel against their nature or at least to find it wanting this is why i think you end up talking quite a bit about taoism um, yes in the book yeah that leads one to the central paradox in my argument which is someone might say but on your very analysis of human beings humans are discontented with their nature isn't that their nature how could they cease to be what they evidently are and it's true that the trajectory or the momentum of my argument feeds off the fact that humans can't be cats. They can't even be very like cats. The most we can hope is to deal with our demand for narrative meaning in our lives, our demand for something more than, more loosely, more in a more relaxed way, in a more, uh, in a less obsessively anxious way. We can't actually change ourselves from being 
the creatures we are, which for a reason, and I speculate in the book, it's just a speculation, of course, I can't prove it, that um, the reason that religions being bodies of practices and less so beliefs that are to do with the ultimate fate of human beings in the world and what happens to us after we die began to emerge historically or prehistorically along with the shock of the awareness of our own mortality. Yes, the consciousness of death. And the question then is what one does about that. I guess to, I just want to go back a little bit to this it's question. Not just, uh, it's not just because, as I mentioned in the book, of course, and as we both know, some species like um, uh, elephants seem to recognize that there's something has happened to some of their kin. Uh, and even cats sometimes seem to recognize that their own lives are coming to an end. But their lives are not lived, as far as we can tell, the lives of no other animal species is are, are spent in defending themselves against the knowledge of their own mortality. Our lives are finite. They're going to be cut off. They're going to end. And not only that, we also know, and from some people, this is worse, much worse even, than the knowledge that they're going to die. They know that people they've loved have died. So I think actually bereavement is a, a, an acute human experience of mortality, which is for many people more vivid and more important than the uh, more formative, if you like, than uh, the knowledge that they're going to die. But at any rate, it's that kind of built-in knowledge or sense of our mortality, I think, which produces um, the need for meaning. And certainly of cats, and I've seen this in all of our four cats, until they're really on the brink of death. There's no, there's no evidence of any kind, you see for your own cat, that it's, it's bothered by it, by it. No, no, my yes, wife, yes. My, my wife is much more bothered by the prospect of, um, <laughs> uh, okay, um yeah. I was this question of nature though. Uh, I want to come back to this because I think yeah. it's, it's important to, in the help to distinguish between what might be a correct description of feline philosophy, um, and, uh, and its application to humanity. I'll come to second nature as um, Pascal called it. Yeah in a habits moment, and, your habits right. and cultures and, and so on. But let's start with the first nature, which is just with the capacity for abstract thought mm -hmm. and a degree of self-consciousness, which is not to be found elsewhere. It's all very well to say, wouldn't it be great to not have that? But now that we've got it, uh, we're kind of stuck with it. Uh, and so to that extent, mm -hmm. we might look with envy on the way that cats are able to experience the meaning in life through life uh, just in the existence of life but we can't get there there is no way to put that genie back in the bottle we can't somehow become cats we can't get rid of our well, of course, I, do, I do say that in the book which is that the point about the garden of eden is a condition in which self-reflexive thought at least isn't recurrent and pervasive in someone's life or mind but once you've left the garden once you've seen yourself to be naked, to use the Genesis mm. story, the Genesis myth, deals with this very question and doesn't refer to a particularly historic or prehistoric episode. It refers to something that's always true and always perhaps will be true. Once you're self-conscious, there is no way back. Right. And that's, I also, I discuss uh, Samuel Johnson's uh, novel there, Rasselas, in which you, you're only in paradise when you don't know you're in it. Once you learn that you're in it and that there's somewhere outside of it, you stop being in it, and then you are tempted, as the Buddha was, and as the fictional character of uh, the prince in uh, Samuel Johnson's novel, Russell, was to leave the hidden valley where everyone's happy all the time and see how others are stri striving to be happy. And interestingly, when he travels throughout the world, he doesn't find anyone, especially the wise people, the sages he consults. None of them are happy. They're reflecting all the time. They're all doing their Socrates bit. They're all being very Socratic, examining their lives. And um, they don't get it. By the way, in this respect, there's a, a nice parallel here with something which Joseph Conrad, a writer I admire very much, discusses in his letters in which he says that to some of the seamen he knew when he was himself a seaman, uh, as he was for 20 years, he said they lived by the code of a code of seamanship and comradeship with other seamen and so on. But they never thought about it. And he's writing to one of his friends who says, isn't it a pity that these people are so ignorant? Shouldn't, shouldn't they be... Uh, illuminated and enlightened from their uh, it's almost a certain side of mill would say you know they should be and he says he said well what would you do which what would you teach them what would you teach them Pyrrhonism, voltaire bentham what would you teach them well, you know john locke you'd lift them out of this terrible ignorance in which they are happy and, and in which they can be virtuous they can help their um, 
they can they are, and, and effective. They can stop the ship sinking in the middle of a terrible storm. They're brave, and they even and this is a very Conradian point. They even behave well when the situation is hopeless. When their fate is to drown, they'll go down. They'll have tried to help as many of their shipmates as they can, but they'll go down in a courageous and dignified way because that's the form of life, that's the craft of a scene ship that they've learned or that they've imbibed. So uh, that's their second nature. Now, it's the second nature, though, in that case, which is not wedded to self-reflection. But it could be in in our case, right? So I happen like you. You mean this in, culture, or yeah, or yeah. All so so we're, you're living in 21st century UK. I'm in 21st century America. So our our second nature is being formed by these institutions of our lives, and so and and try as I might, I can't rid myself of even my second. It might nature, be more general, 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 general because, because of course philosophy. I mean, I argue in the books that philosophy, at least in the not only in the ancient European world, because uh, in the ancient European world. All the first three original schools of Greek philosophy, Stoicism, Skepticism, and Epicureanism, said that their goal was what they called ataraxia, which meant inner equilibrium, or if you like, freedom from anxiety. Yes, which means freedom from ourselves. You have this great, like, cat, cats are happy in, them, happy in themselves. In themselves, yeah. Well, we yeah. try to be happy by yeah. escaping themselves. And it made me think about yeah. um, this book, F and the work on flow by Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi yes. yeah, you, know, you yeah. about losing yourself and, the and, it, and this is and actually even I mean Mill said ask yourself if you're happy and you immediately yes, cease to you did. So. and so you have to be identified with your you, you have, have to be identified with something in your life for yes and, and going to yes and then, but then you're into flow and you you escape from this sort of crippling anxiety and self-consciousness yeah. you wear by, yeah. by by yeah losing yourself in, in in flow and so that's probably the best that most of us can hope for really. well look outside i mean i guess if I mean, to look outside rather than inside. I mean, people think of meditation and contemplative practices as being to do with introversion and going deeply within yourself. <clears throat> and that might be true of many such practices. But some people find an escape from uh, reflexive thought in the natural world, in bodily activity, which is why when I talk about religion, I say the best religions are ones with... Um, Lots of yes. rituals. <laughs> you say, you say, well, actually, it's interesting. It jumped out at me because you say it's belief is a habit of the body. If you want faith, act as if you have it already. But this idea of it being of the That's body. And so I like the 10, 10 rules at the end. It was a sort of a, if Jordan Peterson was a cat, uh, the 12 <laughs> rules for life. And yeah. actually, and, and, it, and one of them is forget about pursuing happiness and you yeah. may find it. So we should, you know, strive to learn from julian your cat and other cats to get to that that sense of life as meaning in of itself and sensation rather than as a project it's an existence and aligning with our own nature rather than aligning with some externally derived project but then you do have a sort of okay if you can't manage that go for a highly ritualistic religion so you know that's where a lot of us kind of land and then thirdly if that doesn't work lose yourself in the issues of the day you talk about the cacophony of politics and celebrity culture it seems pretty clear to me that you ranking two above three right mm. can you talk a little bit about why that should necessarily be the case deriving from your own position well it might be more robust than simply immersing yourself in day-to-day -day politics because because there might be crises like even something like lockdown can denude a person of the everyday ver diversions in which they can lose themselves. If your entire life is everyday distraction and most of it is taken away, you'll be hard up. But if a part of your life is um, outside of the world even, at least in your own belief and your own practice, practice more than belief, is outside anything that can happen to you in this world. Because if you think that your own death and that isn't the end, if that's part of your religious practice, prayer to the dead or the belief that the dead are in some sense still with us or, or can be, then the barrier between life and death becomes porous. And so you won't be so terrified. So you won't need to distract yourself as much. Whereas if all there is are the uh, diversions of uh, everyday life and beyond that, there's just nothing, there will be a tendency to be, to be afraid. Although then again, uh, that isn't by any means universal. There could nonetheless be a generalization uh, ventured that if you have not only a belief system, but some deep seated sense of you and others going on uh, beyond that, then you'll not be so terrified. And that, of course, connects with the need for narrative meaning because the story doesn't end there. Yes, if the story continues past your death, it's not sort of sealed. It's the danger of investing the meaning of your life in a story is that the story 
ends, and it can also end abruptly and unexpectedly. And then who gets to write the next chapter? I'm thinking of that scene. I think Michael Ignatieff writes about this, but the when David Hume, who I know you write well about, on his deathbed, when he sort of one of supposedly one of the first non-Christian deaths, and he just died you know, peaceably uh, with a kind of lack of belief. Well, Boswell came to slightly torment him, didn't he? And Boswell did. But well, it was because Boswell was afraid for him. So, so and actually, think Ignatieff Boswell was terrified. And, but he came and said, "Well, do you not fear?" My dear. Hume said no, but no. Ignatieff has a great line, which is most modern people have all of the terror of Boswell and none of the equanimity of Hume. And I, <laughs> and I, and I think that's the trouble is that actually there's probably quite a lot of people who are caught between those two places. They don't get the satisfaction of feeling like... It's partly, I think, it's partly because, as we mentioned just earlier, up, up till maybe, I don't know, sometime in the early 20th century, the experience of death was much, of, of the reality of death was just so much more pervasive and ubiquitous. I mean, it wasn't a good thing. I don't say it was a good thing, but people were used to it. Whereas now, because in a sense, this is one of, I guess, one of the ironies or paradoxes of progress, when we have been so distant, maybe up to the pandemic, uh, from the experience of death, it's all the more terrifying. The harsh truth, you might think, or but it's also a kind of, in a way, a saving truth, is that when death is ubiquitous around people, uh, actually, uh, they can become used to it. Yes, and not so afraid of it. Somewhat more habituated. So uh, on that note, I wanted to ask you whether you have, since Julian sadly has left us, your cat Julian's left us, have you I, have you got another cat? Are you planning no, to get No, are we, you, are no. You going, you're going to live a cat-free life from now on? <laughs> well, if we acquired a cat now and he or she lived as long as Julian did, uh, I would be um, 96. <laughs> so you're, so you're <laughs> calculating your own mortality <laughs> against the cat? Yes. I think if you if you if you take on the responsibility for another living creature you have to be responsible for their entire lives which is to make them as happy as they can be which i think involves creating the conditions around them in which their nature they may not be wholly natural conditions because they're not in the jungle or but their nature can be satisfied so they be, need to be able to play and as if hunt and um, and, and be, get as much stimulus as they as they need so uh, julian when he got really frail which happened quite quickly we were able it was before lockdown to take him to the vet and be euthanized which was sad but we were glad we were able to do it because if he'd lived a little bit longer uh, in a weak condition a lot of the veterinary services were disrupted and dislocated for a while and then they, um, we wouldn't have been able to do what he did but you have to be able to do that it seems to me I mean that's a kind of ethical matter if you like if you're a human being with all these pretensions to superiority over other animal species. John Gray, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Richard, and thank you for your uh, very good, this very good conversation, for your thoughts and questions about my work, and for seeing it, this book, as part of a larger pattern of thought, which has unfolded over a period now of almost 40 years, during much of which actually 20 years, I would say, but we knew each other, we've known each other. So Correct. thank you again. Thanks for listening to Dialogues. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And if you did, please take a moment to follow, like, rate, and share the podcast in all the usual places. And send me your thoughts and ideas, including for future guests, to dialoguespod at gmail.com. That's dialoguespod at gmail.com. I'll see you next time.